the invitation hymn, if you'd like to hold that, will be page 145. And our communion hymn today will be page 330. I need thee every hour. Do the first and last verse. We now come to the reason why we gather together on the first day of the week. And I'm going to be reading from Mark 14, starting at verse 17. And in the evening he cometh with the twelve. And as they sat and did eat, Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, One of, one of you which eateth with me shall betray me. And they began, they began to be sorrowful and say to one another, Is it I? And another said, Is it I? Let's remember that it's actually all of us, that every one of our sins is the reason why Jesus went to that cross, that as Christians, we can look back to see that sacrifice and actually repent and become Christians, um, unlike Judas, who didn't do that. Judas had the opportunity to repent and become a Christian as well, uh, but he didn't. And as we take of this supper, we need to remember that just like Judas who took the bread and the cup, we too are taking the bread and cup. Um, Again, the difference is, is we have taken advantage of that sacrifice that Jesus had made for us. So for us to hearken to the fact that we were once sinners helps us to examine ourselves as we gather around this table in a worthy manner. In verse 22 it says, And as they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup, when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, as they drank drank all of it, and he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Verily I say unto you, I will no more drink of the fruit of the vine until the day that I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. As we think of the situation we were in and the situation we're in now, let's think of this last verse where where he says, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until the day I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. We have the hope to drink it anew with him in the kingdom of God. And that's what keeps us going from day to day, no matter what's going on in our lives, no matter who who has sickness around us, no matter the sickness that we have, the hope of being able to drink it anew with Christ and his kingdom is what keeps us going throughout this day. So as we take of the cup, And if we take of the bread, let's remember the situation we were in and what we have to come so that we can take this in a worthy manner. And I ask the elders to pray. Our Father in heaven, we do thank you for allowing us to be back in your house once more. bread, his body, and broken it, and let's all fall. For as often as we do partake of this, we do for his guilty sake. We thank you most of all for the one who died on the cross. Jesus, 
place to be able to see if he's one who partakes. And go with us through the service this morning and throughout the day. And help us all that we might continue to serve you better and be faithful to you. Just be with us now as we partake and forgive us for our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Father in heaven, we're thankful for this day, for the many blessings you give us. I love you today, Father, and thank you for all you do for me. Thank you for the help you gave me that I could be back in your house this morning. Pray, Heavenly Father, that you be with us now as we gather around your table. Thank you for this cup, which is your son's shed blood. We pray, Heavenly Father, for bread that you bring for message. Thank you for him and his family. Thank you for each one here this morning, Father. May they be blessed by being in your house. We pray now that you'll forgive us when we've failed you now and watch over us and help us to live for you every day. It's my prayer in your son's name. Amen. Now we come to the offering, and, you know, when we think of uh, Judas betraying Jesus, he sold Jesus, who wasn't his to sell, Jesus' life, for some silver. And we think of how money throughout history has ruled man's lives. And when we think of the money that we have, 
that money is not ours. That money is a blessing from God. Jesus, just as Jesus was a blessing from God, Jesus freely gave his life. God freely gives us the ability to make the money we have. All of this is God's. When we reach into our pockets and we think of the blessings that we have from God and the fact that he continues to provide for us, Jesus willingly went to the cross even though we had betrayed him, even though we're not loyal to God all the time, he still blesses us. So as we reach into our pockets, remember that if you grew up with a great father that provided for you, how many, many more times great, greater of a father is God, if that came out right, than the person that you grew up with? You think of you didn't go to bed hungry, you went, you had clothes, you had a warm place to sleep. God provides that for us now, even when we're not loyal to him, even when we don't show him that we love him, he still provides for us. So as we reach into our pockets, remember that he's going to provide for us, that when we give back what he's blessed us with, we'll be blessed so many more times over. So I'll ask, um, I'll ask Ted Vines if he'll pray for the offering. For the opening scripture, is going to be out of James, the fourth chapter, in verses six and seven. It says, But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Good morning. It is good to be in the Lord's house. Yes, we are missing quite a few due to sickness, but we're glad that you're here and able to be here. And it is uh, right when you think you're over with the headache and the sinus and the coughing, it turns right around and smacks you right upside of the head again, doesn't it? Uh, but we're glad that you're able to be here and keep in prayer. Welcome to more fields when you get a chance. Uh, Ryan's going to ETSU and maybe start to... Uh, Worshiping with us on Sundays, being closer than that old Johnson County church up there. You know, we're, we're, we're a lot prettier down here anyway. I'm just kidding. It's wonderful to have you. Wonderful. I want to get right into the message this morning. It is the first Sunday of the new year, 2022. I pray it's better than last year, don't you? They're still talking about supply chains and everywhere you hear. If you can't get the supplies, you can't do the jobs. If you can't do the jobs, you can't bill. You can't invoice. You can't bring in money. It means you can't hire people or keep people or pay people. It's a rough time. 
A lot of sickness have been out there. I hope this year's better. But it doesn't matter. I know that whatever goes on, the Lord's with you if you're a Christian. But life, some days are hard, ain't it? Some days are up. Some days are down. You win some days, you lose some days. And some days the losses are great. Some days they're hard to swallow. You may just think you can't get through them. Go to Acts the ninth chapter. See if we can learn something from the life of a man named Saul to help us better prepare for this year. And a life that will definitely be full of ups and downs. That's what life is, isn't it? You're up one day, everything's all right, and the next day you're down. Sometimes that down is way down there. To the point that if it's up to you yourself, you couldn't get up. Nor could you get pulled up, helped up, if it wasn't for the Lord. Now, we all got our bumps in life. Sometimes we got mountains in our lives. But the question is, is what do you do with them? With these bumps and with these mountains, do you, do you complain about them? Do you cry, poor old pitiful me, about them? Or do you climb them? As Christians, we're to get our heads up and our shoulders back, and we will run into the bumps and into the mountains, we're to climb them. Listen, we all get defeated. We all get knocked down. And hopefully, we learn from them. Hopefully, we become more wise after standing back up, after climbing those mountains. We get smarter as time goes on. But I look at a country today that they get dumber. This is the dumbest bunch of people in the United States of America. Now, not everybody... I'm talking about the ones we get to see all the time. The ones always on the TV and on the radio and in the newspaper. They have to be the dumbest bunch of people that I've ever seen. At their age, they should be wiser. At their age, they should be smarter. You and I as Christians, when we face these bumps and these mountains and we climb them, we get over them with the help of God, we should become wiser. We should be smarter. And this man uh, named Saul, he later become the Apostle Paul. It was no different for him. For, for him. <clears throat> he experienced good times. He experienced bad times. He experienced up times. He experienced times he was down. But the down times always seem to lead Paul to greater things in his life because he put the Lord first. The hard times, the difficult times, the sad times, he didn't complain. He didn't oh, poor old pitiful me. Like Paul and Silas and Peter, there's always the same attitude. That is, with the Lord, everything's wonderful and great, no matter what little bit I strive and struggle with here. Acts, the ninth chapter, gives us a good, or the whole book of Acts gives us good information on Paul and his life and the ups and the downs and how he become better. How he became smarter. Verse 1 of Acts chapter 9. Are you there with me? Acts chapter 9 and verse 1. I have to get on my glasses now. Acts 1 verse 9. Saul. This later became the apostle Paul. Right now he's Saul of Tarsus. 
He's breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. And he went up to the high priest. And he said, please give me letters that I can take to Damascus, to the synagogues. And if I find any of this way, that's the way of Christ, the Christian church. If I can find any of them, whether it be man or woman, I'll bring them back, bound unto Jerusalem. Saul, later become the Apostle Paul, was a man of authority. Could you tell this? He was an important man. He was a proud man of authority. You give me the letters. I'll go to Damascus. I'll search out those in the synagogues of this Christ way. I will bound them man and woman. And I'll bring them back to Jerusalem. When you first read of Paul and you hear some of the things of Saul of Tarsus, he may be like a lot of people we know today at that time, might have been sold on himself a little bit. Highly educated, wasn't he, John? Speak different languages, reasoning, talking. Probably stuck on himself a little bit. I mean, he was Saul of Tarsus of Cilicia, one of the three largest, one of the three best university cities of the time. And he was from there, studied there, educated. Sure, he had a high opinion of himself, arrogant, if you will. Tell one thing about Paul, being an arrogant person, is about like most arrogant people I know today. Most of them are about crazy. They're about half crazy, if not all the way. They're crazy. They're so stuck on themselves and so arrogant that they're crazy. And Paul was to that degree too. Look at me, who I am. I will go and I will do this and I will do that. Now he later says he thought he was doing it in all good conscience and to please the Lord, but he still stuck on himself because he was going to do it his way. How he wanted to, because he was a prideful man. He was prideful over his religion, who he was, who he was from, where he was from, and what all he had accomplished. And his pride led him to hating the Christians to the point of seeing them put in death, to death, man and woman alike. And he did this because he was indeed thinking he was better than others, better than them, better than most, and very proud of who and what he was. As I said, he was born in Tarsus. He was a Roman citizen. Besides being a Jewish Pharisee, he had all the bases covered. He was proud of it. Some people are so proud of their religion, their religious heritage, that they read the Bible and can't see the truth of God's word in here. They believe what they believe. They're convicted of what they're convicted of. And no matter what God's word says, we'll never change them that's being prideful, that's being arrogant, and that's what Saul of Tarsus was. They can't see the truth of God's word because of their religion, because of their background. They absolutely refuse to accept what God's word says. Don't make a bit of difference what the Bible says. They know in their heart what they believe. It's what my family's always believed, and it's got to be right, because Aunt Jemima Jane didn't go to hell. Uncle Bucky, no way he was lost. Don't matter what the Bible says. This is Paul's attitude, or Saul of Tarsus. He was arrogant. He was prideful. And many times we'll find that our pride 
our arrogance will get in the way of God's truth that we find in his word. Pride often keeps us from submitting to the will of God. I can't see me ever doing that when Jesus did. I can't ever see me going there or performing this or doing this, but yet Jesus did. For people that others thought he should never be around or have anything to do with. But Jesus did. Pride keeps a person from surrendering to the word of God and surrendering to Jesus Christ. Pride keeps the sinner from repenting, changing and turning and coming forth. Pride keeps them from confessing the name of Jesus as Lord and Savior. Pride keeps them from being baptized to meet the blood of Jesus to wash their sins away. But if they do... Pride keeps that Christian from proclaiming the New Testament gospel of Jesus Christ. Pride and arrogance keeps them from living a life that others can see that they're a Christian. Pride just gets us in trouble time and time and time again, whether we're saved or not. You know, the psalmist, excuse me, Solomon said in Proverbs 16, 18, pride goes before what? destruction pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit goes before a great fall James the fourth chapter verse 6 says God resisteth or opposes the proud but he gives grace unto the humble Paul was a proud man but God took care of that he was a proud man, but God took care of that. He, in our study in Acts chapter 9, was humbled. On the road to Damascus, God humbled Saul of Tarsus, this hater of Christianity, this hater of the way, this educated, superior individual God humbled in a miraculous way. Look at verse 3 and 4. And as, <coughs> as Saul journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined right about him a great light from heaven. Saul fell to the earth and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Saul said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you persecute. Verse 6 says, And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what will you have me to do? And the Lord said unto Saul, Arise, go into the city, and there it will be told thee what thou must do. And the men which were with him stood speechless. Verse 8 says, Saul arose from the earth, and when he opened his eyes, he saw no man because he was blind and they had to lead him by the hand. A bright light from heaven, that wasn't lightning. It wasn't lightning out of the east. It was the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the brightness of him not Paul to the ground. Have you ever been knocked to the ground, men? Has somebody ever come up to you and knocked you to the ground? That's kind of humiliating. It's worse when you got people watching. And people were watching here, and they saw Paul humbled by the experience of the Lord Jesus Christ to the point that people had to, when he got up, had to take him by the hand and lead him along. Prideful, arrogant people don't handle such as that too well. Did you say, would you say the Lord humbled Paul, or I'm sorry, Saul of Tarsus at this moment in time? Yeah, he was humbled. Not only did he have to call out to one Lord that he didn't believe in, not only was he blinded, but others now had to help him along 
and guide him every step that it took. God can humble anybody, anytime, anywhere, and about any way you can think of. I'm not a bit happy with the leadership in this country. Haven't been many, many times. Not happy with all the leadership in the, uh, even in this state or in our county, per se. But if we leave all things up to the Lord, I promise you the Lord can put people exactly where he wants them. They can think of themselves awful highly. But when God gets done with them, they're nothing. Reminds me of a king named Herod once. You remember a king named Herod? Oh, he gave a speech and the people said, this is a mouth of God. He's a God. And he in his royal apparel, if you can imagine, stuck his chest out and wiped himself off. And because he didn't correct them and give God any glory but took the glory on himself, he's immediately eaten up with worms. Boy, that's special, ain't it? How'd you like to say that about your family, your forefather, your granddaddy, your great-granddaddy? I'd like to be able to say, yeah, he's eaten up with worms. The Lord humbles like nobody else can. The Lord can put you in your place like nobody else can. He'll take a prideful heart and put it where it belongs. That's what God does, and that's what he did here. If you think you stand, Paul said in 1 Corinthians the 10th chapter, verse 12, if you think you're standing, beware. Why? Nobody, nobody know? Let's try this again. Wake up, people. First Corinthians, the 10th chapter says, Beware when you stand or you think you stand last what? Oh, see, y'all didn't know that, didn't you? Lest you fall. Right when you think you're something, right when you think you got your feet under you, when you think everything's going like it does, you got a whole dollar in the bank account after all the bills are paid. And you really got her going in the right direction. You have the death of a loved one. You lose a job. Sickness comes upon you. A friend disappoints you. A loved one cuts your throat. You lost or lose material possessions. Just when you think you got it all together, you're brought down to your knees. Paul had it, Saul of Tarsus had it all together. He had his life heading in the perfect direction. He had everything figured out. And he was pleasing God in his mind. Then he's brought to his knees on an old dirt road heading to Damascus. I'm going to mention three things real quick that should help keep us humble as Christians. The first thing comes from Philippians, the second chapter. Philippians, the second chapter and verse 3. And I don't want you to forget this. Philippians, the second chapter, verse 3. A couple of things here to keep us humble. Philippians, the second chapter, verse 3. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than themselves. When we look at others being better than us, we can then be humble. When we look at our past failures and remember our past failures, those things can humble us to where we don't get too high on ourselves. And then comparing yourself to Jesus Christ will help to humble you. By comparison with Jesus, we're all just what? A bunch of sinners that could not achieve salvation on our own but needed help. Anytime you need help with something, that humbles you. Anytime you've got to go and say, I can't do this on my own. Can you help me? That'll humble you. And we realize compared to Jesus Christ that we're nothing. 
that we're sinners, then that will humble us. Paul, Saul of Tarsus, become a humbled man. Paul the apostle remained a humble servant of Jesus Christ. We too have to be humbled. Humble to the point of service. You know, I look back and Judas was mentioned that betrayed Jesus Christ. Oh, he was humbled. He was brought down low. He went and hung himself. He killed himself. Done away with himself. Yet Peter failed. As all of us fail, Peter failed. But in a repentant manner, he turned back and served the Lord. That's the choice all of us have got today when we fail, when we are humbled, is our reply. If our reply is a reply of pride and arrogance, we may do away with ourselves. So remind me, I saw, I was reading a thing about a, a sniper training in the military. Some guys with sniper training. One uh, soldier couldn't hit his target for nothing. Kept missing his target continually. Walked back to the uh, instructor with his head down and handed him his weapon and his ammo and said, I, I can't hit a broadside of a barn today. I think I'll just kill myself. And that guy said, make sure to take two bullets. <laughs> it ain't really funny when you think about it because people get in an awful depressed down state because of pride and arrogance. And then they find it hard to come out and repent. Paul was able to repent. Peter was able to repent and have chance. You and I are no different than anybody else that's made drastic mistakes in their life some responded correctly some did not we need to look at responding according to the, to the word of God as humbled repentant Christians when Paul was humbled he'd become a new man when we're humbled and we choose to fo choose to follow him we become new people, better people, learned people, wiser people. Nothing wrong with being humbled. And most of the time we're humbled because of our own wrongs, are we not? Most of the time we're humbled because of our own wrongs. But the Lord said, I'm still there with you. I'll never leave you. We'll get through it. We'll get over it. But when we're humbled and respond in the right way, we too can become new people. Some people think when they enter into a marriage, gosh, I've heard it I don't know how many times. I say, hey, you, you sure you want to go that route? You sure that's the direction you want to go? Yes, because I know I can what? Change them. Woo-wee. That don't ever work. Never say never, but I can't see him. I, I don't remember any time it done. When two entered into marriage and one wasn't right and the other's going to change that, like they're going to hypnotize them. Don't ever work. Don't ever change. You ain't never make your mate do what you want them to do. That ain't marriage, is it? This doesn't work that way. No human can change another people. Only divine change can change a person that is receptive to it. Change. Saul of Tarsus said, what do you want, Lord? In other words, he said, I'll do whatever you say to do. I'm humbled and now I'm obedient. You tell me what you want me to do. Jesus can change a life that will allow themselves to be changed to degrees they can never imagine. You know, when Paul and John 
were imprisoned in Acts the fourth chapter and verse 13. The council there, there it says took notice of them that they were untrained, unschooled, ignorant men that shouldn't be able to speak and talk the way they were to make the sense in which they made but then remembered that they had an association with who? Jesus. Hey, we remember them too. They've been around that Jesus feller. Jesus made a difference in their lives when they were humbled and obedient and decided to choose right. They become different men. They become better men, new men. Now, we influence people with our lives, don't get me wrong. We influence them by showing them Christ and living as a Christian, but we don't change them. You can't change a person. You can do nothing about nobody else but yourself. But ain't it a shame people don't want to change themselves none? They can see where they need to change, but they're so prideful and arrogant. I'd be, that's the way my daddy was. That's the way I'll be. That's the way my grandma was. That's the way I'll be. That's the way my mama was. That's the way I'll be. That's prideful. Arrogant. And keeps people from being influenced. From changing. We can't change people like Jesus did, but we can sure influence them for the better. But when a person, after they're humbled and they come to the blood of Jesus Christ and they're obedient and desire to follow the Lord, ah, great things can happen. Paul become, or Saul of Tarsus become a new man through Jesus Christ, didn't he? Would you say he was different? Mm -hmm. Breathing out threatenings, bringing people to prison, seeing to their death. He become a new man through Christ. Now, before you answer, think. He become a new man through Christ. How? Now, wait a minute. Now, think a minute. Don't just jump out and answer. He become a new man through Christ. How did that happen? Now, most of you think it's because of the power of Jesus Christ, the love of God, the power of the blood of Jesus Christ, but every one of you is wrong. Jesus become a new man through Jesus Christ. That's what I asked, wasn't it? Who did I say? Hey, it's getting lunchtime. My sugar's low. <laughs> Saul become a new man. The apostle Paul become a new man through Jesus Christ because of a man named Ananias. See, y'all thought he was just a lot of people think, oh, Saul of Tarsus, he's saved right there on that dirt road on the way to Damascus. Nowhere in the whole wide Bible does it say that, not even in Acts chapter 9 where we are now. As a matter of fact, when he said, Lord, what do you have me to do? Jesus didn't even tell him what to do to be saved. He said, you got about three days journey. When you get in there and find a man named Ananias, he'll tell you what to do. And then we read in Acts 22, verse 16, that we know Saul was not saved on the road to Damascus. For when he got in to Damascus, Ananias said, Why do you tarry? Arise, be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So he wasn't saved on no road. Wasn't saved by the most miraculous miracle from Jesus Christ. He was saved because somebody told him what to do to be saved. He was saved because he heard the word, the gospel, from another man. It's true that Saul met Jesus on the road to Damascus. Imparted unto him, no doubt, with some sort of faith, for he called him Lord and said, What will you have me to do? But Saul still needed to be humbled even some more. He needed a little time to think about it. He needed a little time to need some help. And instead of him going along and prancing down the road, say, I'm so special. Jesus came to me in a light and saved me on the road right there. No, he said, I had to walk three days to go have another man tell me what I need to do to be saved. That's humbling, ain't it? Think about it. The Lord knows how to humble you. But you have to be able to be humbled. 
Paul needed to surrender to Jesus Christ. You know the sinner surrenders to Jesus Christ when they come in a repentant manner and they say, I believe Jesus is the Son of the living God and they're baptized, immersed to have that old man of sin put to death. Meeting the blood of Jesus Christ, saving them, they surrender then to Jesus Christ and everybody has to do this if you're going to go to heaven. Jesus, before he ascended after his death and resurrection, before he went up to be on the right hand of God where he is today, said, go into all nations. Those that believe, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Then after you've baptized them, continue to teach them whatsoever things I tell you, whatsoever things I teach you and instruct you in, you turn around and teach them. That's humble. Every, every account of conversion in the book of Acts had baptism in it. You know why? Because that's God's way. It is in baptism you meet the blood of Jesus that washes your sins away, and there ain't no other way to do it than that. You got the 3,000 on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. You got the people of Samaria and the eunuch in Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 9, Saul of Tarsus. Acts 22, 16 backs up that account. You got Acts chapter 10, the household of Cornelius. Well, it's about Acts chapter 11 where you ran into Lydia there. Then you got the, uh, the jailer and his whole family. Same hour of the night, meeting the blood of Jesus Christ in baptism for the forgiveness of sin. And that will never happen unless you are humbled. Then you can become, as these people were, new person in Jesus Christ. Nowhere in the Bible can you find somebody being saved that they didn't become a new person. They didn't change to be what they weren't before. To be better than they were before. That's what humility brings you. And with that brings a new mission. Paul's mission was to bring Christians in, punish them, and put some to death. That was his mission. Changed that quick, did it not? When Jesus Christ is involved in your life, things change. You ain't the same old irritable, hard to get along with, despicable individual that hates life and everybody around you anymore. When Jesus gets done with you, you got a new mission. And that's to serve him and to spread the gospel. And that's part of God's plan in our lives too, just like with Paul, to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what we're supposed to do. Listen, life's full of ups and downs. But Jesus can make a difference. Life's full of hard times and difficult times. But if we learn to humble ourselves as Christians and pray and support the gospel and the spreading of the gospel, God will work great things in our lives, allowing us to be new people. And the way we act, the way we react, and the example that we are to those around us. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation. You've heard the plan of salvation time and again in this message, and it's in the Bible. Jesus died. He humbled himself before God to become a sacrifice for the sins of all mankind. We have to humble ourselves and repent, be immersed to be saved. And then as Christians, when we fall, when we fail, when we do wrong, we have the blood applied, and because of a humble attitude and a humble spirit, we come and ask God to forgive us, and he's faithful and just to forgive and to continue to make all things new. Your attitude's got to be right or the Lord will bring you down. And you'll either stand up with a desire to please the Lord and follow him, or you'll just stand up with a hard heart of hate and rejection and despisement. Paul stood up and decided to go seek the Lord. What are you going to do today? Who are you going to seek today? Because the bad things that have happened in your life, because the difficult things that have happened in your life, and you've been knocked down and maybe you're still there, one time, at some time, you've got to stand up. What's the attitude you stand up with? An attitude to serve and to follow the Lord humbly, or an attitude of hate and a hard heart. 
resemble moving forward as a despicable individual. You make that choice this morning. We'll stand and sing verse 1. <laughs>